Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willing. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask him, Who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we are midway through the Advent season. Traditionally, the church calls this Sunday Gaudete Sunday, meaning rejoice. So we're halfway there to the coming of Christ to us. But we often feel the other stress of all the things of the holidays. In fact, I often think of the time before Christmas as the best of times and the worst of times, to quote Charles Dickens. There was a recent poll, in fact, taken, and it revealed that most people have ambivalent feelings about this Christmas or holiday season insofar as we look forward to Christmas, and at the same time, we can't wait till the holidays are over. I guess the challenge, the real challenge for us is to not be so taken up with all the busy, crazy holiday responsibility, but to be more focused on the holy day. So I'd like to talk about how to shift the attention from making it from holiday to holy day. And there we can find a place of peace. There we can find a reason for the season to rejoice. And I think it's John the Baptist who points the way, shows the way for us even in this gospel we're studying today. We're told that John came as a witness to testify to the light. It's those two words I want to focus on. First, witness. This word is used three times in this first sentence, or either witness or its synonym, testify, to order to emphasize this important theme throughout the whole gospel. First, I would mention that it's interesting, in fact, that the evangelist is calling John a witnesser more than a baptizer. The Synoptic Gospels present him more as a baptizer, but this fourth evangelist sees that this role of witnesser is something that every disciple shares in, so that we need to pay attention to this man sent from God who models for us what we all ought to be doing, namely witnessing to each other. Let me just pause on that note and bring it right to home. I know one of the greatest concerns that I hear from so many good people like yourselves are the concern we have for our family and friends who no longer go to church. And somehow that pain is felt a little more acutely in this holy season of Christmas. 
when we know that the very purpose of our coming into this world is to be one with the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So how do we help these children, grandchildren, friends, and co-workers come to church besides asking them for this kind of Christmas gift? <laughs> I would say the, the key word or the advice that uh, John the Baptist would give us is to witness to them. To witness is, is not to preach or teach or stand above them in any way, but simply to share what you have seen and what you have experienced yourself in your life with the Lord, where have you experienced Jesus? Which leads to the second point. And the second key word in this prologue or introduction to this gospel, John came to give witness to the light. And this same word light is used three times, just like the word witness is used three times in this first sentence. I only say that to say there's a purpose for this emphasis It's to bring home that this is who Jesus is, the light of the world. He says this time and again, this is another theme of John's gospel. In fact, the preceding verse in the prologue is, it said of Jesus, he came as a light in a world of darkness, but the darkness did not put out the light. In fact, this is an interesting point historically that many of you might already be aware of. Do you know how it came to be that we celebrated Jesus' nativity on December 25th? You know, I would presume that there's no sure way of telling when Jesus actually was born. In the early days of Christianity in Rome, the Romans believed in many gods, most especially the God of the sun. And they determined that the winter solstice that we would commemorate on December 21st, they figured to be December 25th when the sun was farthest from them in the southern sky. And so the nights were longest and the days were darkest and coldest. And so it was on that day, a winter solstice, December 25th, that they celebrated the pagan feast of the birth of the sun came growing and sharing its light more and more in the world. The Christians said this is a perfect analogy and opportunity for us to celebrate the birth of the Son of God, who comes to share his light into a world so filled with darkness and coldness. He is that source of all energy and life. And so it became a wonderful occasion in commemoration of Jesus' birth. It's an interesting fact, isn't it? Also, in terms of how Jesus, like the Son of God and the sun in the sky, is ever present to us, even though there are many times those his presence is not always felt or the warmth of his love is not always experienced, especially if you live in Cincinnati during the winter months. Whether as it is, Oftentimes in our lives, we experience the clouds of difficulty and the winter season of suffering, and yet we trust, nevertheless, God is ever present to us. And we celebrate that omnipresence in Jesus' coming, so that when Jesus came to us at the Christmas he, although he physically returns to heaven, he spiritually is present to all, for all times, to all people, in all situations. Going back to John the Baptist, these Jewish priests and Levites from Jerusalem are very curious about this holy man of God, as he is drawing quite a few numbers, and they ask him, who are you? They almost answer their own question. Are you the Messiah? And John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you one of the prophets? No. He said, I'm not one of the prophets. Here's a hint of the three expectations most Jewish people had in the day of Christ. They expected and awaited the coming of a Messiah. The one that would come, they thought, this is an important point as I'll reflect on later, they thought would come as a mighty warrior or a royal king that would lead them to overthrow the Roman government and liberate them to be a nation of their own, the chosen people. 
they also expected the return of Elijah. Remember Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, who in his last days was then taken up in a fiery chariot into heaven? So we have the Negro spiritual, we sing, swing low, sweet chariot, coming forward to carry me home. The Jewish people believed that Elijah would then return before the end of time, as prophesied by the prophet Malachi. And Orthodox Jews, even to this day, did you know, when they celebrate the Seder meal on the Passover, will set an empty chair for Elijah and pray that he may reappear to announce the coming of the Messiah. Interesting. The Jews also expected, as the priest hinted at when they asked John, that a prophet would come. This prophet is very specifically the prophet Moses spoke of that would be a prophet like himself to lead the people into the promised land. So they've asked John, are you any one of these key figures? John denies time and again, I am not any of these. But it's as though he's saying, don't look at me. I'm not here to even talk about myself. He says, I am here to simply introduce the one who is to come. That's the beauty of John, isn't it? The humility, the man who said, I must grow less, he must increase, I must decrease. This is what it means to give an effective witness. Who are the people who witness to us effectively? I bet they're always humble people. I think especially Cardinal Bernadine. Humble man of God. And the more humble you are, the louder your voice carries. Mother Teresa. Ah, oh, so humble. And so her witness carries over cultures and continents. These are the humble people the Lord will use. So it isn't how loud you speak or what position you have, but in effect, almost the opposite. If we could just be humble, it, almost the way we live, could, that our actions could speak louder than our words. This is what it means to witness. So these people who come to John then say, well then, who in the world are you? And John says, quoting Isaiah the prophet, I am a voice in the desert. Remember, he's in the desert, crying out, Make straight the way of the Lord. I love that line as John must have identified it and reflected on it and meditated on it time and again and made it part of his own, which is, I might mention, is there any line in Scripture that you've made your own? If you had to, to quote any verse of the Bible that would describe your life, what would you quote? What would you identify with? This is part of where we're being led to reflect on. And John saw himself simply as one who would be a small voice. One thing that spoke a lot to me is because I'm before a microphone often is I like to see myself as a microphone. Micro means small, phone means voice, a small voice for God to speak. Just an instrument, but it would only work if the power switch is on. And I always pray, as I do here today, that God would simply use my voice, that you would hear his word, and that would be amplified only by his Holy Spirit that makes it effective. As Mother Teresa taught us, we're all just instruments. I love her line was, I'm just a little pencil in the fingers of God. Isn't that something? I often think, well, if I'm a little pencil, God better have a big eraser. <laughs> This phrase and quote from Isaiah the prophet that John has assimilated and integrated into himself, a voice that says, prepare the way of the Lord, takes on an interesting meaning if we can appreciate the time in which he's speaking when kings planned to visit a certain remote part of their village or kingdom, they would always send an advance man ahead of them. And he would tell the people to get the roads ready. Remember, all the roads were dirt roads. Very few were paved except for the Roman roads. But John speaking in Israel, far from that kind of sophisticated travel way. So he, the advance man would say, get the road ready, fill in the potholes. And it would also he would be the person who would make the special arrangements to be sure the proper protocol was kept. For John... He was such a spokesman that would say, this is what Jesus wants. 
turn away from your sins, then the Lord will come in. Isn't that wonderful? Clear him a straight path. To me, I think of it your desk. It means getting the clutter out. And isn't that the, the special challenge of these holidays? We've got to clear some space for the Lord to come, that Jesus can come into our hearts. But we, that requires some discipline, that clearing away the peripheral matters. The last question of concern to the Pharisees is, well, they want to know, why is John baptizing? What does this mean? And John, in effect, says, I baptize as a way of purifying, of washing away all the sin. It's like a dramatization of this. Then he says something, and I want to really spotlight, highlight this line. Well, I want it to grab hold of us, because this is the real challenge for us today. He says to the people gathered there before him, there is one among you whom you do not recognize. He is the one. In effect, he is the one you're waiting for. He is the one you're expecting. Ironically, he is the one you're not recognizing. Would that not be true of the Lord in our midst today? And at Christmas time, don't we celebrate not only Christ coming 2,000 years ago, but we appreciate and celebrate the fact he is already here among us. But we use this Advent season of preparation for what? To clear out the clutter and set our sight on the ways the Lord is present among us. But we don't easily see it or say it or celebrate it. In fact, someone just tell me, think of all the people celebrating Christmas today and how many fail to really celebrate Christ. No wonder we are so glad to get over the holidays because they're just holidays. They're not holy days. But when you experience the holy, there's something of a drawing power there that wants to stay. There's some beauty there. If these are holy days then we would want to be right where we are. But how do we make them holy but to recognize the Holy One? I've been praying with this myself, and I'd like to share something with you where this, I guess, came home to me. I was out buying some gifts for some of my nephews and nieces, and I bought this one children's book for my godson entitled, Can You Find Jesus? It's not unlike the children's book, Where's Waldo? Have you seen that? It's such a clever book. Every page, like the cover, is crowded with all these people and a flurry of activity. And, of course, the question the child asks is, can you find Jesus there? It's presumed that they will have some kind of parent or grandparent or in my case, hopefully, godparent, who will ask the question to help the child discover Jesus, but not only discover Jesus, but each chapter of the book covers a different part of Jesus' life. So that from birth to death and resurrection, it takes you through the different ways Jesus is present. To help the child, the artist has beautifully painted or, I should say, pictured different signs, classical, traditional signs of Jesus, that is, an angel or a star or light. You can see in this picture the light, a dove and the spirit, a crown or a cross. All these are signs of Jesus' presence. And again, it's the guiding voice of the adult that brings it all to light for the child. When I first looked at this cover and the crowded picture and the question, can you find Jesus? I thought, this is just like my life. <laughs> my life gets so busy and I see so many people that I have a hard time answering the question I want to keep asking, can I find Jesus? Certainly, this is the challenge of the Advent season, and this is the question and the challenge of John the Baptist and witness. If you will, we all need, I guess, a guide like John 
who will ask the right questions, point us in the right direction, and teach us how to read the proper signs. I'd like to just draw some, if you will, suggestions from my reading this book. Now I'm wondering if I bought this book for my nephew or for me. I don't know. But I, it's funny how children's books can teach you so much, can't they? And maybe that's how we need to approach this very solemn feast of Jesus' nativity as a child. Certainly there's a lesson here that Jesus came as a child. The first lesson I would draw from this is that we need to believe that, as John the Baptist said, Jesus is already among us. In the season we say he is Emmanuel. God is with us. That title means, and it means further that there is no time and no situation in which the Lord is not truly present in our life. Though obviously, naturally, we will not always feel the warmth of his presence, the light of his guidance, or the positive experience of our faith. But regardless, I would say, what page or chapter we are in in our life, whether it be a sad time or happy time, can you believe that the Lord is there somewhere, right there with you? It may seem like a small point, but it actually means everything for this season. I believe we must come to an Advent season of preparation. We must begin to see Jesus is already among us. We must invite people to see it and experience it, but that's not going to happen till we have the Lord within ourselves. And our hearts become like that manger, that humble place where we can hold the Lord and share the Lord with those who come in contact with us. And so I ask the question, can you believe Jesus is among you? And can you go home and believe Jesus is at home with you? And can you look across the table tonight to those you share meals or those you on, talk to on the phone and believe Christ is with you? This is what will lead us truly to Bethlehem, which raises the second question and, I guess, suggestion. Once we believe the Lord is among us, then where do we find him? Obviously, we need to look for the Lord perhaps with the wonder of a child that would look in these pages. Perhaps even this would suggest, again, find Jesus, we need to clear the clutter. I don't think we can possibly hear God speak unless we have found some place in space for solitude and silence. Would you agree? I hope I could call us to, as certainly John did, that place in the desert. Where's our desert place? That place where we have to go apart to find the Lord. I believe it's only in silence where we can hear ourselves talk and the Lord speak. Herman Melville, the popular author, once said, all profound things are preceded by and attended by silence. Silence is golden, for the Spirit whispers to our soul. Perhaps one way to really enter into the Advent season is to find those places of quiet where we can quietly pray and ask Jesus, where are you in my life right now? How are you coming to me? How are you speaking to me? We should never forget this, that the great irony, if you will, paradox, that most of the Jewish people at the time Christ came, were expecting the Messiah to come. However, most of them also missed him in his coming. Why? We need to ask ourselves today. One reason, because there was no room for him in the inn. And with us, if Jesus came today, and he does, does he find any room in our schedules, in our day? with our time. I often think, if we announced Jesus Christ was coming to Synergy Stadium, who would be there? Or 
How many of us say, we just don't have the time? We need to take the time. Also, another reason many people miss Jesus, of course, was that they expected this more powerful expression or incarnation of the Messiah. And he came as a humble baby in a place outside the city of David in Bethlehem. To me, there's a hint of something very important here, that Jesus often, if not always, comes in subtle, humble, gentle ways. And maybe that's why we often overlook him, because the glitz and glitter of society and commercialism and the blare, the noise of commercialism, drowns out that subtle, gentle voice of the Lord. The last thing is that, just like on this book, there are certain signs. Can you point out the signs of Jesus' presence? If we want to really experience the Lord in this season, which the Lord invites all of us to this experience, what are those signs that indicate his presence? Are they not signs wherever we find love, wherever we find joy, wherever you find peace, wherever you find goodness, wherever you find humility, wherever you find truth, wherever you find whatever is good, there is God. The good news is the Messiah is among us. How blessed are the eyes that see, the ears that hear, and the heart to believe and receive our Savior. Amen. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand. Gospel.